Blog Talk Radio. Hello, and welcome to Work Trends with Megan and Biro. Whether you're here to network, learn, or share, we want you to have fun. During this live broadcast and Twitter chat, we'll discuss the future of work with smart and entertaining guests who value today's business and its impact on the world of work for the future. Stay tuned, because we start in 3, 2, 1. Hey there, everybody. Welcome to another informative Talent Culture Work Trends live podcast and Twitter chat. Um, thanks to my friends and my sponsors and the community at large. Um, you make all of this possible. Thanks for being here. Thanks for tuning in. So today's topic, this one is one that's very near and dear to me, and I know to many of you out there as well, it's an extremely important topic in the world of work, education, and when we talk about the biz world, economic prosperity too. I think the world of education and business are at a precipice right now in relation to what we need to do to keep our economy chugging along without slowing down the advancements needed for this country to remain an economic leader. Um, Depending on what side you're on the fence, I know this has been a very long month for us in politics, as we know. Um, And this, I think, you know, this is a political topic. There's no way around it. I think it's awesome. This is where a movement like STEM comes in, right? For anyone out there who is not aware of STEM, this is an acronym for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics in relation to business in academic initiatives, in movement in the country, and others too. So we're going to unpack STEM much more today. Um, I have a really talented and awesome woman here today by the name of Rachel Mann, um, and she is the Network to Transform Teaching Director for Arizona and plans STEM and CTE professional learning for educators. She is a virtual TEDster who assists educators around the country in applying the principles of her TED Talks in the classroom for presentation delivery. She also shares tools for teaching presentation literacy. So we are very excited to have Rachel in the house, and I'm especially interested to dive into this topic with all of you. So let's get this party started, shall we? Um, if you're out there and you're tweeting, utilize work trends as a hashtag. We'd love to hear from you. Weigh in. We want your voice to be heard for sure. Hey, hey, Rachel, what's happening? Hi, Megan. Thank you for inviting me. I'm really excited to talk about this topic. This is something that is so important. Like you were saying, it's important not only in education, but to the economy, to the workforce. So I think this is a, a timely topic for us to discuss today. So tell us just a little bit about um, where you live right now. Just a little bit about Rachel, the person. Okay. Yeah. I I live in Arizona. I actually grew up in West Virginia and taught secondary school in uh, in Virginia, Northern Virginia, for fourteen almost fourteen years, and also taught in Arizona, in Arizona before moving to the Department of Ed and working with career and technical education. And that's actually where I uh, really gained an interest in STEM education is looking at the teacher shortage that we already have in Arizona and across the country. And it just oh, for, okay. for, STEM, for STEM areas. It's, a, it's an area that's so, so important, but we also are having a hard time gaining teachers and um, when it comes down to it no doubt. in order to yeah. in order to uh, have a strong economy we have to produce students that are interested in these areas so what about i don't know if it's your upbringing your goals your dreams what motivated you to become an ambassador for the stem movement because everyone has that story right that's what i find so interesting about people we we all have our own unique story what's your story and how did how did STEM become such a powerful piece of your story right now? All right. So I was, for most of my teaching career, I was a career and technical education teacher and I taught culinary, culinary arts to high school students and was always intrigued by the concepts that were within, within, my, uh, within my discipline that tied in with the science, the technology, the math, and even looking at now we have food engineers, 
that's a, that's a that's a new field that's that's huge and it's making a difference on um on yeah. solving world hunger so i think that just seeing all of those connections and seeing the need for for stem education and the impact it can have and especially the technology piece i love using technology and seeing what's out there and um seeing what's being engineered and cooked up next so it's something that's fascinating to me, and um, I enjoy hey, seeing it on, and hold on. Breaking, breaking news. Did you just say what's cooked up next? Did I just hear that right? <laughs> yes, you did. <laughs> and, and is your last name Man with a double N? This is Why, good stuff. yes, it is. <laughs> Interesting. Interesting indeed. <laughs> <laughs> so listen, here's a absolutely startling fact about the need for technical people in the U.S. right now. Does everybody have their seatbelts on, coffee in hand or not? In May of 2016, a jobs report conducted by CNN Money, which is, they've got some cred, right? They indicated there's currently 5.8 million job openings, which is a symptom of a growing problem we have here in the U.S., right? Employers can't find enough skilled workers for tech jobs. Still, right? I think this is in part due to the great strides in, in technology, of course, as we know. That's where I've lived most of my career. But I also believe it's due to the short sightedness of both academia and business. Why are we not working together collaboratively? This is something I've been talking about for a gazillion years now to actually promote technical careers, and not just to some students, but to all students, and especially younger girls. Let's be honest, right? Is this a flaw in our society right now? Is this a preconceived notion of women being in re- careers still that require softer skills? Like, what's up with this? Yes, Do you it, tell. it does reflect a flaw in our society and just the gender stereotypes that exist regarding what's considered non-traditional careers for women. And we need to find ways to defy these gender stereotypes if we're going to make a change and find ways to encourage more females to pursue STEM related fields so that we can help fill these skills gaps and these shortages of STEM workers. And what's interesting is research shows that this problem isn't just about what's happening in the higher ed. It goes all the way back to the developmental stages of children and the toys they play with. So when you think about what toys girls usually play with versus the blocks and the Legos that boys Mm -hmm. are given to play Mm -hmm. with, Studies show that because of the spatial skills and the cognitive skills that are developed as, as children, as males versus females, that that actually makes a difference in their interest as they're growing up and even how well they perform in different, different subject areas, such as STEM. Rachel, are we seeing this in young children around the world or is this just something that's happening here in the U.S. from your perspective, by the way, when we're talking about this topic? I would would have to say it's globally. I just saw an article yesterday talking about how uh, girls in India who are, who are learning how to code and how that's such a big breakthrough. Um, I think that it's something that's, that's kind of a, a global issue that everyone is seeing a need to push through these barriers and, and make an impact and make a difference. Hmm. Interesting. Well, I mean, I think although women fill close to half of all jobs in the U S by the way, they hold less than 25% of STEM related jobs right now. And at the same time, 43% of school age children today are African American, Latino or of native American descent. Yet this is what's staggering to me. All of the engineering bachelor's degrees in the U S less than 15% are awarded to underrepresented minorities. So wondering from your perspective, I mean, what can we do to reconcile these opposing trends so that the composition of our STEM education pipeline actually reflects our shifting demographics that are so prevalent right now, right, that we've been talking about for a number of weeks, certainly leading up to that election, right? What's going on with that? Yeah, for sure. Well, and I think that that's something that we do have some schools that are doing a great job of addressing this. There's a school in Arizona called Peoria Met, and Met stands for Medical Engineering and Technology. 
And one of the things that they're doing to address this issue is they're making sure that underrepresented populations are being mentored with folks who are successful in these career STEM career areas so that it's encouraging youth, it's providing them with role models, but then it's also helping the students develop these different skill sets. Um, but, it, but I also think about, about folks like Sheryl Sandberg when we go back to Women in STEM and a book that she wrote on the, uh, with the topic Lean In. And she refers mm-hmm. to a comment that Warren Buffett made where he said that in reality, he was only competing against half the population. When, you kept, when it comes down to it, when you look at, he was referring to women, yeah. but when you look at minorities yeah. and the uh, discrepancies there, he was really competed against, competing against much less than that. So uh, one of the quotes that Cheryl said was, when more people get in the race, more records will be broken and achievements will yeah. extend beyond to really benefit us all. And I think that in STEM, that's especially, especially true and important. Interesting. So if one of the factors to help support the STEM movement is to introduce students at an earlier age to sciences and math, Why do you think so many school systems fail to meet this need right now? And are there trends happening both? I'm sure you're really close to what's happening in Arizona, but are we seeing trends uh, across the board in the U.S. right now on that front as well? Well, Megan, I think that what it's a commonality across the United States is that we have this focus on testing. And so more time is spent on developing student skills in areas that they're going to be tested on because of the growing stakes for accountability. So when there's pressure to earn high ratings, if you're in an area that has school grades and you have the community pressuring schools to make sure that those scores are high, that's automatically going to cause schools and teachers to really focus on areas such as language arts and math and sometimes ignore these other skills such as science, technology, and engineering that are so important to, uh, to the future oh for the students and for, for our society. And it's really, Are you seeing it's, change? I mean, it's like what's happening? You're in the trenches every day in this. Like, are you seeing that needle move? I, well, it is, it's very political, and we know that we're going to have a lot of changes coming up with the new administration for across the country. So we'll see what will happen yeah. as, as changes start to occur. But we really have to find a way to help teachers because they have so much that they're trying to fill into a school day already. How do they fit in these vital areas such as STEM? Or how do they refocus mm-hmm. and reinvent education so that we're not looking at isolated subjects? but we're looking at education as a whole or skill sets as a whole. So how do we re-examine how we're looking at education to make it more effective for what we need for, for our future and to keep up with the changes that are happening? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, what can teachers, what can, what can we do? What can parents do? What can aunts and uncles do? Mentors, cousins, you name it. Like what can we all do? to keep science and math in front of students in a fun and encouraging way right now. Because I just feel like if we don't all step into this, we're not going to make a difference. It just feels like Mm -hmm. we've really lost a lot of momentum here. So like, what can we all do like right now for the next year to make this Mm -hmm. more pressing, more fun, more encouraging, more of a movement in your opinion? Well, our students are natural explorers. I don't think that it takes effort to make students really want to explore and learn these areas. I think it's providing the right environment. And some things that I see being done now is creating maker spaces where kids and families can go in and start tinkering together and figuring out problems they want to solve and creating engineering things that, that they think are, um, will make an impact or even schools that are offering passion projects or genius hour that's modeled after Google where there's 20% time where students are able to really explore and dig into some of these areas that are of interest to them. Another thing is there's apps. There's an app called bedtime math that parents can make Mm -hmm. learning fun. And as an activity right before they go to bed, that get on the app there. You've got your technology and your math in one plus some quality time with your child right before bedtime. Ah, very cool. We should all check out that app. Uh, What's it called again? (laughs) It's it's called um, Bedtime Math. And learning should be fun. Somebody have a hashtag? Somebody better hashtag that. 
I know they're on, they're on Twitter. <laughs> nice. Well, shout out because I think that's a brilliant app. I mean, with all the apps that we're absolutely inundated with, and half of them I think are like, in my opinion, a complete waste of time. I mean, what mm-hmm. about an app like that? Let's celebrate that, right? I think there's absolutely. so many, there's so much cool things we can be doing. It's amazing. So what mm-hmm. about parents? How can they band together and work with their local schools and children to keep science and math top of mind in a strong program in their community? Because as we know, a lot of this has to do with that whole political system we're talking about, right? I mean, there's, oh, there's some heavy politics so there, so it's... Well, and so sometimes it is a matter of staying in touch with your policymakers, staying, being involved in parent-teacher associations, but getting involved in other ways that's actually supporting schools and supporting teachers, such as volunteering to host an after-school club for robotics, or there's a website mm-hmm. called code.org, and they encourage everyone, even even adults. Um, I Love think it's a, site, they the say like yeah. three, it's three to hundred and three. But I host an hour of code event to encourage uh, encourage students and adults alike to start learning code together. But just find, finding it. ways to really get involved, make learning fun. It's okay if it gets messy, but we're learning together, finding out what doesn't work, and finding out what does work. And how can role models step in and set examples? And and how are careers in the sciences and math more interesting to build from your perspective? Like, what are you, what ideas are you working with the community on right now, more more specifically, or do you have case studies? I think that looking for ways to volunteer, sometimes that can be time consuming. So even doing a um, doing a virtual Uh, guest speaking with with a college or with a high school with a group of students. Uh, The other day I was asked by a college to talk about global collaboration and creative communication. And we we jumped on um, virtually because I had a keynote earlier that day. So we were on virtually and we had, we had a great time discussing how how to use different tools such as Periscope and um, to, to really collaborate with folks around the world. And it's it, love it's fun hearing to see. about Periscope, from right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. But there's yeah. so, so many different tools to collaborate with with all the technology we have at our fingertips. And another idea uh-huh. is to host a virtual field trip where students can virtually see what your work environment's about, find out where there's potential job shortages. And maybe do a Q and A with some of the folks who work at the business, but really getting involved in ways that doesn't require necessarily leaving your work site if that's a, if that's a time consumption piece, but finding ways to collaborate non traditionally. What you know, because we're a pretty social community, so we're always fascinated to talk about how communication tools like Twitter, like Periscope, like Facebook Live, right. I mean, we're all moving toward right. video, right, and, and, and visual content more and more. Are you seeing students use video and visual content or teachers or people in your business community? I mean, talk to us in this community a little bit more about social media and digital and how what you're seeing unfold. Are there surprises to you that, you know, you're not using more of one tool than the other? I mean, just talk to us a little bit about that side of this. Well, and that's such an important topic because right now our students have at their fingertips the ability, the entire world, and you can't take that back. Some of the things that get posted, that's going to impact them uh-huh. for the rest of their lives potentially. So I think it's so important to really teach students how to use these collaboration tools, how to use their voice in a responsible way. And that goes hand right. in hand with STEM. How are you being a, 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 a global citizen when you're using these different tools. But I, I do see students using these, and even organizations such as Ed Rising, FFA, DECA, some of the student organizations with, within CTE, they really embrace these tools and make them part of some of their state and national competitions, which, which I think is oh, yeah. great. It's really teaching them how, to, how yeah. to use their voice in a responsible way. And at what age are you seeing this become either appropriate, in your opinion, or, uh, you know, timely? I mean, what, what are you seeing in terms of age groups and adoption from this perspective? 
from what I've seen, it's been mostly more of your, your high school students that is starting to get involved right. in the high school levels, maybe ninth grade, and then working their way up. I think that that we have to be careful, too, with even protecting the identity of our of children, and they yeah. have to learn how to use these tools in a responsible way. So it's important not to <laughs> jump in too really? quickly are with you, giving too you many really tools and too much access. Then you, you may not be friends with me on Facebook because I tell you, I got a lot of friends out there and we're learning all sorts of things about their families and their kids. And so, I mean, we're very much, in, we, we live in, in, a, in a sharing society, right? That is so true. I think, yes. I think, <laughs> I think you and I, I mean, I think you're coming from your certain lens, which I can appreciate, mm-hmm. but like when I look at like my friends, my colleagues, my, my community at large, it's a real mixed bag um, in terms of how Do people you- are sharing their lives with the rest of the world. Now, do you right? think it's more of the parents sharing out for the younger children or allowing children Definitely. to, to Definitely. access? Definitely. That, Definitely a lot of parents, a lot of proud a, parents out there, which is amazing. Yes. <laughs> you know, it's amazing. It keeps life more but interesting. they're making and, those choices. Yeah, it's, it is. Right. Uh, right. And the interesting thing is at what way. point do kids start making their own choices about it? And what will they say Ten years from now, about how mom and dad and, and you know, aunt, auntie and uncle or whoever cousins, how we all have been sharing stories. I think it's really fascinating, mm-hmm. actually, if you look at it from that perspective, because there's so much mass adoption still happening on channels. Mm-hmm. I know, like recently, I have fallen in love with Instagram. Like, if you hang out with me on Instagram, that's where, like, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Facebook, I'm on LinkedIn, of course, but for me, lately, it's been Instagram, you know? I just love, I, right. I don't know, I like the they community, find you I like Instagram. the culture there. You're going to have to find me. I'm at Megan M. Bureau. By the way, out there, All community, right. if you're listening, find me on Instagram. <laughs> I'm loving it. I'm just finding that, you know, it's just that place for me right now. And, you know, we all ebb and we flow when we go through changes. But um, I think it's just, I mean, I think you and I could actually unfold this at a, uh, as another topic completely. But let's oh, talk for a moment about this global picture. We, we know, I talked about this a little bit earlier, but we know that other countries outside of the U.S. have strong educational initiatives in place to promote math and the sciences, right? I mean, this is not, this is a speculative question, but what would it look like in 10 years from now, right? Speaking of 10 years, if this country were to reduce the number of work visas allowed each year, and how could this action affect our economy? Because this is a political topic, I'm not going to lie. As we know, oh, it is, it is. And we definitely need to grow our own and tap into our human capital here in the United States. But as our world becomes more global, we do need to tap into and learn from others as well. We um, have an infrastructure in place to build this workforce, but already have a shortage in STEM areas. So how do we get enough people to fill these positions if our country would to reduce the number of work visas allowed each year? And, um, and that could hinder our, our ability to compete globally in STEM areas, which is yeah. so, so important yeah. to be able to keep our role as the United States. And, and two, I think about even my, uh, my in-laws, my own family. My father-in-law came here from India, and he was on a student visa. He stayed on a work visa, and he eventually became a U.S. citizen. And he spent his life as an engineer here in the United States. He has patents that, were u- that are used worldwide for offshore drilling. And now my husband mm-hmm. is here as an OBGYN, another STEM field that is a high need shortage oh, really? area. So these oh, different contributions, yes, <laughs> lots of STEM <laughs> in, in lots my family. Lots of STEM but, going uh, on over there, lady. Absolutely, <laughs> That's, so it's so important. <laughs> but but too, if we were to reduce the, that number of visas and those contributions, I think it could be devastating to I to our too. country, yeah. to this our is, relation with other countries, and for time. Economy. This is not the time to be doing that. We're already suffering, no. frankly, in my opinion. It's like, uh oh. I hope everyone <laughs> kind of keeps that in mind. That not what we need if we want to be future forward, right? If we want to be looking it, ahead, it be taking, staying yeah. competitive. What's so strange to me is that we live in a country of people who relish technology, right? Think about it. Smartphone usage is skyrocketing, skyrocketing, right? Intuitive cars are now in demand, medical tech advancements, 
especially here in the Cambridge and, and Boston Mass area where I'm living, they're growing every day and have essentially mm-hmm. extended our lifespan as as a, as, a hu- as humans. With all of these things being so important to us, why do we still have such a disconnect with being a developer of these technologies? You know, and I'm not talking I, about just here right. in Cambridge because I mean I I'm really lucky in that. You know, a lot of my career has been here in the Boston and the Cambridge and the 128 belt working with high tech brands. But why are, I mean, that's, that's not the case all over the country. Let's be honest. Right. You know? And I don't think that it's our, our society being opposed to being a developer of technology as much as not knowing where to start. I know I come up with some fascinating ideas, but I don't know where to start with them. And with STEM education, we're giving folks a starting point. So if you have that basic knowledge of STEM and you know how to tinker and play with these concepts, I think that that's part of it is just not knowing what the first step is to become a developer. So by providing those tools, I think that we could see some change in this. And then too, I think that it it comes down to engagement, the priorities, you know, we have things that are handed to us that we're able to use so we don't necessarily need to go up and develop something. So I think that as, as um, STEM continues to grow and as we be competitive in STEM areas, I think that we're going to see some changes in the area of becoming developers of technology. That's way cool, and I'm glad to hear it. So, you know, we only have about four more minutes left here. What closing notes of encouragement do you want to leave with our listening audience about how they can help the STEM movement, um, and fill us in also about what you're up to next. What do the coming weeks look like for you? Where do we find you? Um, I'm excited that you're going to be doing more blogging, right? And you and I are going to be mm-hmm. putting our heads together about collaborating more, which I'm really excited about because this is I am I think where this and business comes together is really important. So I'm passionate about working with somebody like you to say, what can we do as a team? You're coming from one unique angle. I'm coming from another. Let's make something work here that's positive. So tell us. And we need to make those connections everywhere. So I think that pulling business and education together, supporting education, teaching is the career that makes all other careers possible. So how do we really combine what's happening in the workforce making sure that teachers and educators are aware of what's needed. Over the summer, we hosted an event called Lesson to Life, where a group of educators actually went into 14 different companies in Arizona in the Phoenix area, went into the electric company, to medical companies, went in to see what's happening, what's the cutting edge technology, and to ask questions about what we can do to better equip students. So I think making connections and really building the bridges so that there's not this disconnect between what's happening in education and what business and industry needs for their future employees. Sounds good to and me. And then as far as and as far as what's coming up, so I'm at a conference right now in Vegas for career and technical education. It's called the Vision Conference, and we have over five thousand folks here to talk about education and STEM and making those connections. And I was looking through the list of the vendors and exhibitors, and we have tons of folks with just expertise in so many STEM areas. And we're closing off the conference on Saturday. We have an event called STEM is CTE. And the whole focus is on how we can support uh, women and minorities and increase the number of folks that are entering into STEM and CTE careers. So oh, that's, that's awesome. something that I'm really excited about and to see how that unfolds. Well, I'm glad you're there. I know conferences are such a great op to just, you know, hang out with people in real life, shake hands, get to know each other, and really understand, like, what is happening. It's so important to stay tuned. So, listen, we're out of time. Uh, Rachel Mann, thank you so much for being my guest today. This was awesome. And uh, oh, we're going to continue this conversation, not only today, but into the future, because it's an important one. Absolutely. Thank you, Megan. Thanks. Over and out.